Hi everybody, welcome back to The Human Perspective. We're starting to do things a little bit differently today and Maria Towns, our first guest. So we're going off script and trying to be more hip and modern. <laughs> <laughs> and for someone who's about 70, we'll see how hip and modern I can be. But we do have hip and modern Maria Town with us oh today. My and she definitely is hip and modern. <laughs> so <laughs> she's one of these people who has done like amazing amounts of work in her lifetime and will do much more in the future. So welcome to The Human Perspective. Thank you. So tell me, or tell us, who are you? Um, as you mentioned, I'm Maria Town, uh, <clears throat> Astros fan. Uh-huh, yeah. uh, <laughs> great game. Yes, uh, I currently live in Houston and I work as the director of the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities. Um, but broader than that, I am a public servant, I'm a sister, um, I'm a lover of red lipstick. You could tell. Yeah. What's the name of it? Lady Balls. Lady Balls. I love the name. <laughs> it's a great name. Yeah. So, um, you've been in Houston now how many months? Eight months. It's mm -hmm. certainly been a whirlwind. It, it has indeed. Um, it's, you know, before I was in Houston, I lived here in Washington, D.C. and worked for the federal government. and. Um, making the transition from federal to local government. It's, it's a big shift. Yes. And um, and so now, you know, I'm doing policy work like I was doing for the federal government, but I'm also, you know, getting phone calls from people who, um, you know, in the summer were people with disabilities who didn't have air conditioning and figuring out how to, how to get their air conditioning replaced or... So you really were the person and still are the person in Houston who's dealing with the results of the hurricane and its impact on disabled people in the community. Absolutely. And you know, there's there's a lot of us who are dealing with the impact of the hurricane. I think the whole city has been dedicated to it. Um, but, you know, I'm lucky in that my office is designed to be an advocacy office inside the, the city. And so a lot of times we'll get calls from folks who've reached out to other organizations and maybe they haven't heard anything. Um, and we get to be their advocate. And I'm also the person, you know, who is vigilant, right? I, I go to the health director and say, we, we have to make sure that people are not going from shelters to nursing homes. Like, can you assure me that everyone who was living in the community before will continue to live in the community when they exit these shelters? You know, we have to ensure that our, um, our housing repair programs can cover things like rebuilding ramps or installing grab bars. Um, and getting people connected to the equipment they need to survive. And that's been a lot of what I've worked on. So, because the audience can't see you. Okay. Um, maybe you could explain. You have a disability, what is it? How I, does it affect you? I do. I was born with uh, cerebral palsy. I call myself a wobbly person. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I've, you know, it's been, been my whole life and I've, I've used a wheelchair, I've used walkers, I've used crutches, canes. Um, and you know, it, it impacts. One of the reasons why I started to wear, I don't know if you know this, Judy. So I wear red lipstick for very specific reasons. Oh, yeah. um, one of the reasons I wear it is because, is to honor my grandmother. Um, her name was Joanne and she was a wonderful woman and very vain and um, she wore red lipstick all the time. Uh -huh. And uh, we were very, very close. A lovely legacy. Yeah. Um, but the other reason, and there's two other reasons that I wear it. Um, I started, you know, when I was growing up, I think like a lot of girls in general, but particularly- Where did you grow up? I grew up in South Louisiana. Um, I'm originally from Baton Rouge, and then I moved to a little town called Hammond. And uh, Hammond, when I was growing up, had 18,000 people in it. Um, and then Katrina hit and it grew very rapidly, but it's still pretty small. So um, I've had a big, uh, a mix of very rural experiences and city experiences. It's been good. Um, but I, you know, <clears throat> I really didn't like my, my body a whole lot when I was in junior high and high school, which I think is common for girls. Mm -hmm. But particularly because I had this, you know, mobility disability, it was about not, you know, kind of not embracing my body as it was. <clears throat> and I started wearing um, red lipstick and like a dress and I realized that 
when people would stare at me, they would get confused. It was like cognitive dissonance <clears throat> because they know they're not supposed to stare at someone who's disabled. Right. But they also know they're supposed to acknowledge someone who's beautiful. And um, when I started wearing red lipstick, it, cr it started creating that dissonance and I loved it. It helped me control that interaction with strangers. Um, and then, because I started wearing red lipstick so often, it became a way for people to recognize me, particularly people uh, who are face blind or who are autistic. Mm -hmm. And so I've literally had other disability advocates say, oh, you're Maria Town, I, I genuinely didn't recognize you without your red lipstick because it's like a grounding point, so. It's a great story. It's an accommodation as well. <laughs> and 12 years old, so we were talking earlier. Uh -huh. When did you get involved in debate? I got involved in debate when I was uh, 14. I was a freshman in high school. And, um... Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. I'm just going to put something in the kitchen. Thank you. A little wine being delivered by our neighbor. Hi, it's like a Mr. Freely, <laughs> who's the postman on Mr. Rogers, speedy I delivery. I don't know. I didn't want, I was too old to watch uh, Mr. Rogers. <laughs> Mr. Rogers and I have the same birthday. Oh, you do? March 20th. McKeeley and I have five. I hope I didn't throw in your pie, Mr. No, 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 it's fine. <laughs> so, um, you got involved in... In debate, yeah. yeah. I was a, you know, I, I was a competitive kid, I, um, but I didn't get the chance to play sports like a lot of children do. And um, when I was in high school, I signed up to take a speech class as an elective. And um, there was a speech and debate club also. That was an extracurricular activity. And in my first, you know, the first time I ever delivered a speech in front of my classmates, it was just something that clicked. Liberating. I mean, it was. And um, it was as if I'd found this strength and this skill that I never knew that I had. And, you know, my teacher, her name was Gigi Westmoreland, um, we're still, you know, in touch. Um, she was just a huge supporter of me and fostering my my talent and my skills and also fostering my potential as an advocate. Yeah. So one of the stories we were talking about had to do with um, a major speech that you were giving. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could give us a little more. So um, by the time I was a sophomore, my school knew that I was a, a good speaker and I was invited to um, audition to, um, or I was asked to choose represent the school's beta club in the original oratory competition at all of our conventions. It was a big honor for me, and I wrote this speech on educational inequities in Louisiana, which I would still speak on today. <laughs> uh, and my teachers said, you know, Maria, this is a good speech, um, but we really want you to give a speech about your disability, because we know if you do, you'll win. And um, how did you feel about that? Oh my gosh, I was so angry. I, at the time, I didn't want to have a speech about disability because, you know, I knew the moment I walked up on stage or to a podium, people understood that I was disabled and I didn't want to be marked as a one trick pony. I wanted to show people that it was more than that. And it came down to, okay, do I write this speech about disability and compete, or do I just say no and not compete? And I ultimately chose to write the speech. And I remember thinking to myself, and at the time I like didn't curse at all, but I, internally I remember thinking, well, if I'm gonna write a speech about disability, it's gonna be a damn good one. <laughs> and so I wrote this. Made it a damn good one. Well, it was like, it's not a speech I would deliver today, but it's a speech that hits all of the typical hallmarks of like inspiration and perseverance and a, a key to it was a story I told of something that happened to me in preschool um, which I hadn't told you yet no. oh, goodness. so when I was really little I did something called serial casting um, right so they put my legs in casts 
to make my bones grow oh, straight. For a second, I thought you were saying C E R E A L casting. I was thinking, oh, no. television. <laughs> no. Serial. Got it. Yeah. C A S G I N G. So for uh -huh. pre K and kindergarten, I had casts all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was super stubborn, um, and my, my preschool was at the top of the hill, and the playground was at the bottom of the hill. And so every day I would roll down the hill and crawl back up the hill. Um, and it was a thing that people just accepted that I did, and thankfully, you know, my parents were like, let her do her thing. Um, there was one day when it had really rained and it was muddy, and you know, everybody had come back from recess, and I was still crawling and um, struggling a little bit. And all the kids lined up at the top of the hill and just started chanting, I think I can, I think I can. And when I got to the top of the hill, they started screaming, I thought I could, I thought I could. Huh. Um, and so imagine that story being told in a much more artful way. And that's what really like got so how people. did that impact you? I mean, that's something that I've, before I wrote that speech, you know how you have those moments in your life that are so special, you don't tell anybody about them because they're just yours to hold on to, mm -hmm. that like help keep you going when things get really dark? That was mine. Um, Wonderful story. Yeah, and then with the, with this speech, it became you know available for public consumption. Um, but it, but my teachers were right. You know, I won, um, and I. I spent, Do you feel like you compromised? yourself or was it like a coming out story? It was, well, it's not necessarily a coming out story because it didn't get to, and I didn't know at the time, my values as a disabled person, right? I wasn't coming out as like a proud disabled person. Um, but I was, I was coming out as somebody who embraced my disability, um, which is a little bit, who was beginning to embrace my disability. You were 14. I was 15 at this point. Okay. And um, that day during the state competition when I delivered my speech, there was a woman in the audience who was moved. Uh, she was, I mean, really just crying. Her eyes were welled up, snot was coming out of her nose. And, you know, my speech was meant to touch people but not hit them over the head, you know? And so I went up to her afterward and I asked her, are you okay? And she said, you know, my sister has cerebral palsy. She can't walk, she doesn't speak, but I know she has something to say and I know she has something to contribute. And when I saw you on that stage, I knew that you were speaking for her. And that's when I realized that my disability gave me a unique and valuable perspective on the world and that my skill as an orator was something that I had to use um, to benefit my community to benefit people with disabilities. So how have you built on that? Um, so part of, I mean, one of the reasons that I, you know, became involved on campus and in college is because I could be a good representative for the student body. And that's something that has continued in my professional work. You went to Emory. I went to Emory. Mm -hmm. um, and I majored in anthropology. Uh -huh. <laughs> It was a very good major. Um, and in my professional role with the Department of Labor, with the White House, and with um, the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, a big part of what I do is uh, building relationships with the public, public outreach, um, and, and delivering um, speeches that are focused on specific content or writing talking points for someone else like the Assistant Secretary for Disability Employment Policy, President Obama, or now the mayor. Mm -hmm. um, and the mayor is interesting because he, uh, he's, he, he, he's a real straightforward kind of guy. And one of the things that I've had to learn is how to capture someone else's voice while still putting in what I want them to say. Right, it's complicated. Um, but, that's, uh, but that skill kind of started, you know, um, in, in high school and learning, okay, if I want to deliver a speech that makes people feel like this, how do I change my own tone, and yeah. So, what messages do you give? I mean, you've done a lot of work also. Um, you're young yourself, yeah. but you, as you've been developing, you've been involved with helping to set up a number of different groups that were really peer support groups mm -hmm. for younger people. What do you see as the importance of those, and what messages do you have for younger people who are um, trying to decide whether or not they want to identify as a proud disabled person? 
I think peer support for anyone across any age is critically important to our survival. I mean, at a very base level. Um, I didn't see another young disabled woman who was really kind of building a good life for herself until I was 23. Mm -hmm. And that moment, I, I met a woman named Jennifer Kemp. Um, yeah. You know Jennifer? Jennifer's great. Yeah, she's amazing. And she changed my life. I mean, just meeting her. And I remember, um, you know, she had a she had a house, she had a career, she had children. Um, and that was a big thing for me. I, you know, I didn't know if I could have kids. And um, talking to my able-bodied mom, it was not a productive conversation, right? Um, and that's the kind of conversation that other young, disabled people who want children should be having with right. one another. Um, and so I, a lot of what motivates my work is making sure that people can experience the joy of disability community um, because in, in many ways it's life-saving um, and, and, and life-giving. Um, and in communities where there isn't yet a disability community, right. what suggestions do you have? Mm. So one of, the, one of the things that always comes up in, in that scenario is like online communities. Um, and I think social media, um, things like Facebook have been incredibly valuable for providing individuals with community where there may not be much of a disability community. The other thing that's a reality for many disabled people in the United States and, and the world is that um, outside of major cities, there's a real lack of public transit. And so their engagement with community writ large is highly regulated and is highly um, prescriptive, you know. Um, so they may have limited ability to really get out of their homes and like mm -hmm. seek out a center for independent living that's 30 miles away. Um, so that's the other reason that online stuff is very important, but there are barriers to that too. I think um, for in instances where there's not a lot of community, some, if you're an extrovert like me, one of the ways I started building community was just seeing disabled people on the street and going up and talking to them and saying hi. I mean, my first probably year and a half in DC was filled with those experiences. And that's actually There's how- There's a reason I like Maria, because we both <laughs> do some of the same things. Yeah. Um, and now in, you know, in, in Houston, I want to do the same thing. Um, and sometimes I have, you know, I wish that like, there should be like a nod, you know, or, or a wink we can give to one another or something. Yeah. Yeah, hey, sister. Um, but I, that's definitely one of the recommendations. I also think um, for people who are involved in existing community organizations, whether it's a church or a synagogue, asking the leadership, hey, you know, is there somebody else that's been in this community, may not be an active member now, but who also has a disability that you know, we might be able to get together? Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, the disability community has a lot of complicated relationships with organizations like the Special Olympics, but when I was growing up in Louisiana, uh, I didn't participate in Special Olympics, but it was the only thing that I knew about, you know? And so I think that sometimes those organizations can have value on a much more local level than we might think about this sort of at a, uh, for, uh, at a yeah. national level, if you see what I'm saying. So I have one other quick question yeah. before we end. What about your blog on CP Shoes? Oh, goodness. Well, so you asked about my message. This is one of the big ones. I think, uh, you know, as disabled people, we inherently break a lot of norms. When in reality, disability is a norm, right? It is a natural part of the human condition, as we all say. Um, and I started CP Shoes for a lot of reasons, but one of the things that sort of a very real thing is when I would go to interview for jobs because my shoes were always torn to bits, I was worried that I wouldn't get hired, not because I wasn't qualified, not because I wasn't capable, but because my shoes didn't look right. <clears throat> and I want disabled people, particularly young disabled people, uh, to realize that they should, can just own themselves and, um, 
not necessarily have to try so hard to pass and to conform with these really ableist standards like professionalism that don't allow you to stem or that don't allow you to wear tennis shoes to work. I wore sneakers almost every day in the White House. Mm -hmm. I briefed President Obama mm -hmm. in Nike high tops, you know, and that's one of the big messages that I try to send to disabled people. Like, you know, you have to wear loose fitting clothes in order to accommodate a, a pump. Great, be fabulous, you know, just em embrace that and make, make it, it a part of you and make it a part of yourself, yeah. So thank so, you very much. I So I have the same thing. Marie and I had a great conversation yeah. a couple of years ago about shoes because I'm still wearing the same pair of shoes that I bought a couple of years ago. And I regularly go to shoe stores trying to find shoes that will fit me. Um, but I'm basically a one extra wide. I call them my sausage feet. And I keep praying that the shoes that I'm wearing will hold up. Because as of today, I still haven't found any shoes that really fit me. So. Thank you very much for coming. My pleasure. Thank today. you for having me. And uh, look up Maria both on her blog, but go to what's going on in Houston with the mayor's office. Um, Maria is a leader and is a star that will continue to rise. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks.